the church. We are the church. That is the title of our new series as we dive in this week. I'm so excited to be able to support Megan and Tech Carpenter as they head off to northern Ecuador. Uh, One of the things that we look for in missionaries is we're looking for missionary partners who are reaching the unreached people groups around the world, where they're they're going, uh, so to speak, where no Christian has gone before, where no missionary has gone. So we're excited to partner with them and planting churches in northern Ecuador. Megan said it earlier this morning that we exist as C2 Church to build life-giving churches that lead people to find and follow Jesus. And that includes the extension uh, of our work through our missionary partners, through Kingdom Builders. And so as you give to Kingdom Builders, you are supporting missionaries all around the world. We are the church. The, the carpenters are the church as they take the gospel of Jesus Christ to northern Ecuador. We are the church, and if we are to understand God and his work, we need to understand what the church is. When we talk about the word church, I want to make this distinction that we're talking about the capital C church, the church, the church universal, right? This is the thought when we talk about the church. We're not speaking of an individual church. We're not speaking about a, about a denomination. We're talking about the church universal, the church that is global, not just throughout the world, but through all of time. That is the church. It is God's church. Jesus Christ is the head of that church, the scriptures tell us. So when we talk about what the church is, what do we mean? What do we mean? We talked a little bit about it over the last couple weeks as we uh, moved into a small group launch. We talked about community, and we talked about a little bit, just touched on it, what the church is. But as I told you, we're going to dive a little deeper over the next seven weeks in our small group series. So if you're not in the small group, we are encouraging you to get into a small group or start a small group that is centered around the seven-week discussion about being the church. So what do we mean when we talk about the church? I grew up in the church. I was actually told, uh, Megan, when I went to uh, Venezuela for the first time, I was training with a seasoned youth pastor, and we were working through how we would share our faith in another country. And he warned me to be very careful about using the phrase, uh, I was born in the church. Now, we would all assume that meant that you just grew up in the church or uh, if, and that kind of thing, where you just went to church your whole life and it was part of your normal rhythm. But here's the thing he told me. He said, be careful because when, in some cultures, when you say you grew up in the church, they assume you're an orphan. That you literally grew up in the church and to, to a lot of places, especially in South America, Africa, and around the world, the church is primarily those who take care of the orphans. And so he said, we've translated that phrase and, and people would come up to those students and say, I'm sorry, you're an orphan. And the students were like, what are you talking about? So I grew up in the church. I, my dad's a pastor. The church to me meant, meant a lot of things. It was the place where I hung out more times than I I care to admit. I've heard some of you say things like, well, when I I grew up, my family was in the church whenever the doors were open. I think I have you beat because I was there when the doors weren't open. (laughs) It, It was a place where I make great friendships. I experience deep hurt. Some of you can identify with that. But the church has come to mean a lot of things to me personally. But as we talk about being the church, we have to answer the question, what is the church? What was it supposed to be? What is it meant to be through scripture? Matthew chapter 16 is where I'm gonna launch from this morning, starting in in verse 15. It's a key to understanding uh, the church modern day, but we've got to read this so we can kind of take us back to some other things that'll give us a depth about the church. Matthew 16 is a conversation between Jesus and the, uh, the apostle Simon Peter. And in this moment, there's a profound statement that Peter says, and then something even more profound that Jesus says. So here's what it says in Matthew 16, starting in verse 15. 
He, Jesus was asking the disciples, who do people say that I am? And some were saying, according to the, to the Old Testament, they were saying, you are, the, you are the prophet Elijah, you are John the Baptist reincarnated, you are this, you are that. And he says, but who do you say that I am? He says this directly to Peter, but what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the living God. All of their answers revolved around the prophecies from the Old Testament scriptures. This is how Peter comes to identify who Jesus is. You are the Messiah, the expectant Christ of Israel, son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. As we talk about this scripture Many times people talk about Peter and the rock and the play on words here, if you're not familiar with the Greek, Peter's name is in Greek is Cephas and it means rock. And so Jesus is playing with the, the name of Peter and referencing it for his statement. He says, you are Peter, you are rock and upon this rock I will build my church. Now, many have assumed, and this is, this is sort of the Catholic faith tradition, is that upon Peter, the apostle Peter, who they claim is the first pope, this is what the church is built on, is upon that lineage of Peter and that authority. But that's not exactly how it should be translated. He, Jesus is making a play on his name, you are the rock, but the, the true rock, he says, this refers to the statement that he makes when Peter says, you are the Messiah, you are the Christ, son of the living God. Jesus was saying, upon this, I will build my church. Upon that statement of faith, upon that revelation of faith. It is true that the church was built upon the truth that this apostle, Peter, is proclaiming. The apostles built the church and upon the authority that Christ had given them. So what is the church? Many claim that it's in this moment or the, or the book of Acts that the church is founded, is launched. It's find its start. But let's define what the church, what church means. The church is the called out assembly or congregation, you could use either one of those words, of the people of God. You see, the church has a history that extends beyond the New Testament. And this is important to understand. It's important to understand the past so we can understand our future. It's, un it's important to understand who we are as a church so we can understand where we are going and who we should be. The unfortunate thing about the word church, and especially when we talk about the church, is that the church does have a past. It has a speckled past, if you will. Many of us may think of the institution of the church, whether you think specifically of a denomination or you just think of the institution. But if you look at the past of the church, there are some dark spots. The Crusades. The control and corruption, sometimes complicity with evil governments, even genocide, Christians killing Jews throughout time in the name of Jesus seems rather odd since Jesus was a Jew. Oftentimes, the government has taken the church and its authority, if you look into the past, the Church of England, the Roman church, the Roman Catholic church, the government has used that control and the church vice versa has used the government's control. But we are separating 
the meaning of the church from those things. We certainly need to apologize for those things. But we're separating from that. Because the definition and history of the word church extends beyond what we typically assume. Like I said, many assume that the the church shows up in the New Testament. It's like this new invention that Jesus comes up with. Many think the Holy Spirit is this new invention that shows up in the book of Acts. But we need to look at the Old Testament if we are to truly understand the New Testament You have to understand the Old Testament. I find it funny sometimes when I see pictures of Jesus, uh, pictures of Jesus in the church, and I know they're modern day depictions, but there's this thought that Jesus went to church when he was on earth. You wouldn't be wrong, but he didn't didn't show up in um, an American church, (laughs) right? It seems ironic. But Jesus went to synagogue. Some of you just went, oh, what? Yeah, he, he, he worshiped at the temple. He didn't go to church. He didn't sing the songs we were singing. Jesus didn't have hymns. Whoa. <laughs> so what does the Bible say? And we can't, we can't ignore what the Bible leads us to understand about the church. So what is the church? Exodus chapter 35 introduces us to the first picture, one of the first pictures of the church. Exodus 35 says this, Moses assembled the whole Israelite community and said to them, these are the things the Lord has commanded you to do. In in that scripture, assembling all the congregation or the community This is the first gathering of the church. Now stay with me because it's going to all unfold. If you read Exodus 34, Moses goes up on the mountain of Sinai to receive the law from the Lord. His descent from that mountain at the end of chapter 34, just as Moses is assembling Israel, he, uh, he descends from the mountain with the law. What you need to capture in this moment is it's a great picture of Jesus' second coming. You've heard me refer to Moses as a type of Christ. He's a, he's a picture of Christ. And so we see a lot of prophetic meanings in how Moses relates to the people of Israel. Jesus is a greater Moses, it's been said. Many theologians will say that. It means that Moses gives us a picture of what of who Jesus or who the Messiah will be. This is how we are to understand who Jesus is. And this is a picture of his second coming. So if you can picture, Moses descends from the top of the mountain where he's met with the Lord. It's a picture of Jesus' second coming. And the gathering of the people of Israel is a picture of the end of time when he will gather all of Israel and all believers together. The Old Testament prophets, as well as the New Testament prophets, allude constantly to the gathering of Israel and the believers from the four corners of the world. And this concept helps us understand the meaning behind the New Testament word church. Now remember, what Jesus and all the apostles would have understood this to to mean, would have, all the meaning would have been derived from the Old Testament. Many people fail to understand that the disciples did not have the New Testament when they were uh, under the ministry of Jesus. It didn't come till at the end of their life or middle of their life at least. So they, everything we know from what they knew is from the Old Testament. This is key. They didn't have the, the four gospels. They hadn't been written yet. They had none of the epistles. None of them had been written yet. So all their knowledge, all their expectation is from the Old Testament. So what did it, you have to ask, what did it mean to them back then? This is absolutely critical. If you're ever going to understand scripture, you have to ask, what would it have meant to them in that moment? If you don't ask yourself that question, this is what preachers called exegesis, when you not exit Jesus, exegesis, E-X-E, 
and then the rest of the word, G-E-S-I-S. That's, that's, they didn't grade me on, on spelling the word. It means you are understanding the original context of the scripture. Who was it written to? Who was it written by? When was it written? What was going on? What would they have understood it to mean in that moment that it, they would have read it or heard it? And so in this, this moment, when we look at what's happening in Matthew chapter 16, all the expectation would have been wrapped up in all the Old Testament prophecies. So what did it mean... What did the word church mean to the New Testament disciples? Do you notice? Sometimes the way I interpret scripture is noticing things that aren't being asked or being said. None of the, none of the disciples in that moment look at each other and go, what is this church he speaks of? Right? If the church doesn't get launched until the book of Acts which is three, probably about three years from the time this conversation happens in Matthew, how come none of the disciples are lost? Like, I don't really understand this church. What is, what is he talking about, right? They obviously knew what he meant. If we, and if we don't ask what they would have thought about what Jesus is saying, what they would have, uh, what the context, what, instead of doing exegesis, we would do eisegesis. Not I so Jesus. I so Jesus. I don't know if you Jesus, but I Jesus. I so Jesus means I read into the text what I think it means, what I want it to mean, or I interpret the scripture based on my context rather than the context of what is going on when it was written. Does that make sense? Are you with me? Say, yes, I'm with you. All right, very good. You just woke up your neighbor. So this is important. That the word church is not introduced in the New Testament. As a noun, the Hebrew word is kahal, which means assembly, congregation, or community. And, and the, the Old Testament refers to the community, this community, this church, basically as the tribes of Israel. That's the assembly. That's the original church. And this is a common biblical term throughout the Hebrew scriptures. And this is, this is how we know, because when the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, are translated into Greek in about 300 BCE, before Christ, it, the Hebrew scriptures are translated into Greek, and the word kahal it now takes on the Greek word ecclesia. Many of you may have heard somebody preach about the ecclesia, the church. That's the Greek word for church. If you're unfamiliar with the Septuagint, it's just the Greek translation of the Old Testament. They did the Torah, the first five books first, and then over the 70 years, they did, uh, I think it was about 70 years, they did the rest. And it's said that the Septuagint, this is an interesting uh, note, that the tradition is, as the Septuagint was being translated, it was given to 70 different scholars to translate, and they all isolated themselves to translate it independently, and when they brought them together, the tradition says they had come up with 70 identical Greek translations. Is it true? I don't know, but I believe God protects his word, so I believe it could be true. So what happens to the word ecclesia? Well, when it occurs in the New Testament, English translators rarely translated it as assembly. They translated it with the word church. And the chur that word church sometimes has led, misled people. Because of this double standard uh, of translation, it appears to most readers that the church first appears in the New Testament, completely disconnected from the assembly or the congregation of the people of Israel. After all, the word doesn't appear until the New Testament to the book of Matthew. But translating ecclesia as church, our English Bibles have led us to believe that the church is a new institution outside of Judaism, outside of the roots of our fellowship with the Jewish people. Now hear me. In case there be any misunderstanding, I am not saying you need to become Jewish. Just putting that out there. Okay? But here's an interesting thing. Many of you have heard of Tyndale or the Tyndale translation. Did you know Tyndale was 
executed. Because in his translation, and he refused to change it, his translation did not use the word church, the English word church, but rather congregation or assembly because he believed that what was happening in the other translations was the Roman Catholic's ability to use the power structure that separated the common people from the laity. And he refused to do that. And so they put him to death. He was fighting against this structure that separated the authority from the common people. Now, is there lines of authority in scripture? Absolutely. But not that separates the people from God. And this is what was happening at that time. If you put the government in charge of something, they're going to screw it up. And that's what happened. All right. Don't focus on that. All right. All this information about the original language implies that the New Testament church needs to be understood in the continuity of the Old Testament, the Jewish people, not as a disjuncture, not as something separate, because in the broad sense of the Old Testament, the church was the Jewish people. And I will add to this, all those who believed in the one true God, all those who believed in the God of the Jewish people. If you understand in the Old Testament, when the people of Israel are brought out of captivity out of Egypt, there are many Egyptians and slaves from that had been captured all over the world that came out with them. They were called sojourners. They made the one true God their God. It doesn't mean they converted, but it means they worshiped the one true God of Israel. And so in the the broad sense, the church began as Israel, God's chosen people. But in the narrow sense, all who believe in the one true God and his son, Jesus Christ, is the larger church. All who cast their allegiance upon him are the church. What I found interesting is in in an article by uh, Gary DeMar, he writes uh, the article called The Church is All Over the Old Testament. He says something profound. I think this is important. Dis- dispensationalists, if you know what dispensationalism is, it's the belief that there are eras within the Bible, and one was the law, one was grace, one was Israel, one is the church, and that, that those are separate things. It's an error in theology, in my opinion. As there, uh, it says, dispensationalists continue to spread the false claim that the church is something new in the New Testament. As a result, dispensationalists make a distinction between Israel and this supposed new entity called the church. The argument goes something like this, he writes. When Israel rejected Jesus as Messiah, God stopped dealing with Israel and started with something that was unknown in the Old Testament, the church. He goes on to say, first of all, Israel did not reject Jesus as the promised Messiah. Some Jews did, those in authority did, but some Jews didn't. It's the remnant principle, if you know of the remnant principle in Romans. After all, the gospel is first preached to the Jews in Jerusalem from every nation under heaven. So Jews from around the world had converged on Jerusalem and heard the gospel preached to them. The first converts were Jews. Peter's message was directed to the men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem and the men of Israel. When the people heard Peter's message, they were pierced to the heart and asked what they should do. And what did Peter say? Can you remember? He said, if you'd all bow your heads and close your eyes. If you want to raise your hand and pray to accept Jesus and you'll get to go to heaven. He didn't say that. He said, repent and be baptized, which is an old covenant symbol in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, right? This, this is the beginning of something new, but not new at all. Peter tells him this is what was happening was a promise to Israel from the prophet Joel, He says, this is that. This is what's happening. The new covenant is starting in this moment. It's not concluding, but it's starting. It says, not long after that, those who had heard the message and believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. See, Peter is looking backwards, and he's saying, that prophecy is about this moment, about the Messiah and the people of Israel. Here's what's interesting. The disciples saw themselves as a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, They didn't think they were starting something new. They assumed everybody else would eventually come along. 
and see Jesus as the promised Messiah of Israel. This is important because if Jesus isn't the promised Messiah of Israel, he can't be the Messiah at all, which means he's not our Messiah either. Those believing Jews in that moment are part of the remnant, the ecclesia, the church, the assembly of God's people. They called themselves the church. But again, notice as Peter talks about the church, as Paul talks about the church, as Paul persecutes the church, no one, nobody says, what is this church you speak of? What are you? They understood it to mean them. So this is important. This is important to understand the church in our modern day context. The church is a people. Everybody say that out loud. The church is a people. The church is a who, not a what, right? Amen. While we understand that going to church might mean an event, that is not the end of what the church means. Church may be something you attend, but it's greater understood as something you participate in. And we, we spent several weeks talking about this. Throughout scripture, God identifies his people not only as a people he rules and leads, but also the people who are the object of his love and his faithfulness, often described as his bride, that the church would be his bride and he their husband. We see this when God leads his people out of Israel. Look at Exodus chapter 6. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and number one, his four promises, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, I will deliver you, deliver you from slavery, so he's basically saying, I'm going to take you out of Egypt, and then I'm going to take the Egypt out of you, right? Fast forward to our lives, God brings us out of sin, and now he wants to bring the sin out of us, our sinful ways. Number three, he says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, with great acts of judgment. Number four, and this is important, I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. This is important because the gathering at Mount Sinai takes place after they have been delivered from Egypt. In Exodus 19, Again, here's the Lord. Now, therefore, if you will, uh, will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you will be my treasured possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Right? This is the Lord speaking to Israel, his assembly, his congregation, his church, that they would be his own people. One of the translations of that word is possession. You will be mine. Exodus 35, we spoke of it earlier, when Moses comes down the mountain and speaks to the congregation, the assembly, in Hebrew, kahal, in Greek, ecclesia, in English, church, as they gathered around the mountain, what takes place in Exodus 35 is a marriage ceremony. It is a Near East marriage ceremony between God and his people, his bride. And so he says, here is what I promise you. I will love you. You will be my own. I will take you out of Egypt. I will take the Egypt out of you. I will do all that is necessary to bring you into the promised land, and you will be my people. The Lord makes a vow, a covenant with his people. And then the people make a covenant to the Lord. They say it back to him. We will be your people. We will be, care we will be careful to do everything you have commanded us. If you can imagine in this moment, in the, in the cosmic arena, the question is being asked, God, do you take the people? The Lord says, I do. People, do you take God? And the people say, we do. In this moment, under, understand this is a, a, maybe a little extra for you, that in this moment, the people don't just say, we will or we do. They say, we will do everything you commanded us which is important to understand that they obligated themselves to the entirety of the law given by Moses. 
which brings great understanding to why the Jewish people follow the law and why we as Gentiles have very little obligation as Gentiles to the very same law. That's a whole other set of things to talk about, but it, it brings some understanding. So here's this marriage ceremony. And understanding that Israel was to be God's bride, they were to marry God. Now look at the book of Hosea. Hosea is commanded to marry an unfaithful bride. Have you read the book of Hosea? It's kind of like a soap opera. (laughs) The Bible's not boring, you're boring. (laughs) Hosea, marry Gomer. That's just funny right there. (laughs) She's a prostitute. Hosea the prophet was commanded by the Lord to marry her and be faithful to her, even though she was unfaithful multiple times to him. And this was a picture to Israel of who they were. They were prostituting themselves to all the nations the Lord had said to ignore and, to, and not to go their way. Don't intermarry. Don't have anything to do with them. And yet over and over again, Israel would walk away and God would restore. Read the book of Judges. They would fall away. God would send a judge. He would restore the people over and over and over and over again. But it reveals God's faithfulness and grace to his people throughout all of time. Therefore, I contend that the church throughout all of time, from Old Testament to New, is the beloved bride spoken of throughout the whole Bible, inheriting the kingdom and its promises. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 25. He's describing marriage, and what does he do in in describing marriage? He describes the love of God, he says, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present herself her to himself as a radiant church without stain, wrinkle, or blemish, but holy and blameless. The church is a people. It's not a building, it's not an event. It's not a moment. The church is a people. And here's the the continuation of that thought. The church is the people of the kingdom of God, and Jesus is the king. Capture that. The church is the people of the kingdom of God, and Jesus is the king. Faith in Jesus is Not simply, I said a prayer once so I can go to heaven, because I don't really like the alternative, I'm just saying. Faith is I've pledged my allegiance to him and to him alone. That is what faith in Jesus means. God's ultimate purpose throughout all of scripture was to dwell with a people that would be his very own. Think about from the Garden of Eden when he dwelled with Adam and Eve in the garden. Throughout all of time, he longed to dwell with his people. We are told that at the end of all of it, after a thousand-year reign of Christ, where Christ is cleaning up the earth and rule and reigning in peace over all the earth, at the end of that, Paul the apostle tells us in the New Testament, Jesus turns over the kingdom of the world to God the Father. And what's the picture we get in Revelation? God comes and dwells with his people. Isn't that a beautiful picture? That's the future of the church. But we have to understand the past so that we understand the future. The church is the subject, the subjects, if you will, of the kingdom of God. The kingdom is the object owned by the king. Do you understand that? If there is a kingdom, there has to be a king. When Jesus came preaching, he didn't preach Specifically, the gospel as we preach it, pray a prayer, go to heaven. Jesus didn't say that. What did Jesus preach? He preached, the Bible says, he preached the kingdom. Repent, for the kingdom is near, or the kingdom is here, right? The king is proclaiming, I'm here. Wherever the king is, there's the kingdom, right? Does that make sense? The disciples would have heard him preaching the kingdom and would have understood it through the terms of the Old Testament. So how are we to understand it today? 
it's important that you understand this. We don't believe in replacement theology where the modern day church, specifically American church, we don't replace Israel. Because if we replace Israel, then that means God is not faithful. So instead of believing in a kingdom that is being replaced, think of it as a kingdom being expanded. Paul the Apostle preached a Gentile gospel, which is different than what Peter was preaching, a Jewish gospel. Paul was called specifically to the Gentiles to preach to them how they might become part of the kingdom. Up until now, the Jews had been like, nope, it's just us. And Paul was one of those people. But when the Lord got a hold of him on that long, dusty road to Ashland, I mean, (laughs) no, Damascus, knocked him off his Mustang, his horse. It changed, and Paul knew that he must go to the Gentiles, and you see that progression as Paul goes to the Gentiles and he preaches. This is that. It's not just for Israel. It's for all of the world. Think about all the prophecies that say that every tribe, tongue, and nation will worship the king. Well, how is that possible if it never expands beyond the Jewish people? We are the recipients of God's grace to the Jewish people, Paul says, for without them, we have no gospel. We have no king. We have no Messiah. And we are the recipients of God's grace. We are part of the church of Israel. It's important that you understand that. Romans 11.1, 1, Paul says this. Has God rejected his people? What's the next line? Shout it out. By no means. And he says, I, I myself am an Israelite. He says, I'm, I'm one of us. But verse 17 goes on. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, and again, he's speaking to Gentiles, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you all remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. He says, that is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. Their lack of faith, he says, but you stand fast through faith, so do not become proud, but fear, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he won't spare you either, Gentiles. Verse 25, he goes on to say, this gospel to the Gentiles is a mystery. I often, one of the questions I often get from people is, well, what does Paul mean when all of Israel will be saved? Can I just tell you, church? Three important words that you probably should hear from your pastor more often. I don't know. I don't, I don't know that I understand all of it. I do understand that God is a mystery and has a mysterious plan that I don't quite grasp all of it. But I do know this. God is at work and God has a plan. In Ephesians 3, 6, Paul goes on to say this. The mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. Members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel Through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. So the church is the people of the kingdom of God, the called out ones, the ones that are separated out. That's what the church is. We are separated and we are the kingdom of God together with every believer around the world. And here's something that Roman says. As part of the kingdom, don't be conformed to the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can walk in the ways of this kingdom. 1 Peter 2.9 says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Very similar to what we read In Exodus, right? In Exodus 19, you will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Revelation 1.6 says this, and he has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve God and the Father. Listen to how all of this overlaps with what the Old Testament has said and promised. The thing is, we tend to individualize salvation so much that we see God's work as all about me, right? Right? 
And salvation, faith in Christ, is an individual, personal decision. It is true that God loves you personally. But here's, here's where this, this theology of personal salvation gets a little errant, is that we tend to individualize it so much that we don't look at the big picture, that God is at work saving a people that will be his very own, the church. I've heard it said, you know, if, if you were the only one on earth, Jesus still would have come. Totally true. But that's where, where that stops, right? The fact is, you aren't the only one. I'm not the only one. God is doing a work to bring his kingdom in, a f- in, in the fullness through the people of God. And it's always been about his people. From the beginning of time till now, it's been about a people that would be his very own. And we, as Gentiles, non-Jewish people, got grafted in to the promises that were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's. And he's creating a people that will be a kingdom to priests to him. Listen, the, this is the last thing this morning. The church is a people in process. Amen. We are all in process. This is not an excuse for, it, for you to use for you to go on sinning, okay? I've heard people say, well, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm in process. We're all in process. Yes, we are. So you better look more like Jesus tomorrow than you did today because that's the process. The Bible calls it sanctification. That the moment you receive Jesus, you place your allegiance on him and him alone, the Bible says you are sanctified in that moment. You are made clean and you are made whole. But the process of sanctification continues as you live your life. So it's a now and not yet. You are sanctified, but you're not completely sanctified. You're not fully sanctified until that moment you pass from this world into the next. It's the same thing about the kingdom of God. The church is the kingdom and the kingdom is the church, but today's church is not the entirety of the kingdom. We are a a kingdom that's now and not yet. We can't compare the church now to what it should be, the beautiful bride without blemish or spot. We're not there yet, but we will be. We're not the fullness of the kingdom or the fullness of the new covenant yet, but there's been a down payment, a deposit by the Holy Spirit, moving us to be more and more the fullness of the kingdom of God both as individuals being sanctified and the church being sanctified more and more. I kind of compare it to, I I think there's this expectation of the perfection of the church. Again, not an excuse, but the reality is the church is growing, each one of us, more and more like Christ. We can't compare what we are now to what we should be or will be upon Christ's return. But I compare that to expecting a four-year-old to act like a 14-year-old or a 14-year-old to act like a 40-year-old. It's just the wrong expectation. How how would a four-year-old really have a maturity or understanding to act like a 14-year-old or a 40-year-old? But as we grow more and more like Christ, we bring more and more of the fullness of the kingdom to this world. We are a kingdom awaiting its king. We are a bride awaiting its groom. And so we must live like it. Every day, expecting, expectations that Jesus is returning and I must prepare. I must prepare. I must become more and more like Jesus by the power of his Holy Spirit helping me. Look at the beautiful picture of Acts chapter two. Because it does give us a picture of the church, the, uh, almost an ideal, if you will. It says in Acts chapter 2, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. Awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. And day by day, attending the temple 
Together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That's an ideal picture of the church. Right? That we should strive for. One of the questions for small groups this week is, when you look at that ideal picture, how do we live that out in small group? Which is a perfect place to live that out. I know some of today was a little bit more academic, but it's setting up what I believe where God is leading us for the next several weeks. My invitation to you today, church, is to step into the kingdom, into your piece of the kingdom. What is God having you do? Second part is that is step into being part of the church. Be part of a small group. Begin serving. Be part of the local church, lowercase c. Because that's how God is moving and working in the church, or in the world, is through his church. And then finally this week, walk as children of the kingdom. There's something about knowing who you are and who you're meant to be that changes the way you walk and the way you talk. When my older brother was a senior in high school and I was a freshman, when he was around, I walked and talked differently. He was the captain of the football team. I was four foot 11. (laughs) Everybody knew who he was. Nobody knew who I was. But when he was around, I could walk a little bit differently. I knew he got me. I knew he had me. My sophomore year, he'd already graduated. Not so much. (laughs) Walk as children of the kingdom. You are children of light in a dark world. So walk as children of light. Walk with the confidence that the king is coming. And like the parables that the king Jesus told, he wants you to be faithful with what he's given you. Not like the scared person who hides it away and doesn't do anything with it, whether out of ignorance or fear, it didn't matter. They didn't know the king. Walk as the faithful servant who knows the king, who knows the reward, who can't wait till the day of judgment because on that day, that day of judgment, you'll receive a great reward. Remember, the day of judgment isn't a day to fear for those who know the king. You settled your account. You know that the reward will be yours. Would you stand with me all over this room this morning as we close in a time of prayer and reflection. Step into the kingdom. For some of you, you need to place your faith in Jesus. And I want to give you that opportunity this, mo- this morning. Two, be a part of the church. I encourage you again, get into small groups. And if you don't have a small group, start one. You can go online and there's some options there to help you find or start a small group. And finally, walk as children of the kingdom this week. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes with me? in this holy moment. Maybe this is your moment where you pledge your allegiance to Jesus Christ. Not not to me, not to anything else, but to him and to him alone. There's a power the moment you say to Jesus, I surrender my life to you and I will live for you. If that's you and you wanna take that step today, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand here in a moment. Not because it's the only step, but is the first step we believe in walking this journey of faith. So if that's you this morning, no one's looking around, but I'm gonna have you raise your hand because I wanna pray with you and all of us are gonna pray together. If that's you, when I count to three, would you simply just raise your hands and then you can put it back down. And we're gonna pray a prayer together. We'll give you some next steps. But if that's you, I'm gonna count to three and would you be bold enough to raise your hand? One, two, three. Is that you this morning? Would you lift your hands all around this room with other people? Thank you, sir. I see your hands. Somebody else? Anybody else? I see your hand in the back. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, sir. I see your hand in the back there. Anybody else? Family online, our hosts are dropping a link right now for you to respond and and they would love to connect with you. Then church, let's pray with all those who raised their hands this morning. Would you repeat this prayer out loud and hopefully it will reignite your faith as well. Say, dear heavenly father, Father, thank you for loving me so much much that you sent your son Jesus 
to live the perfect life that I could not live. He suffered in my place. And he died to pay my sin debt. But thank you that he rose again to give me new life. I receive that new life. I ask you to forgive me of going my own way and help me to go your way. In Jesus' name. Church, I'd love to pray with you this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus and by the power of your Holy Spirit, would you help us to live as your church? as the kingdom that is being revealed more and more each day, that your kingdom would come here and now as even Jesus prayed. Your kingdom come, your will be done here and now on earth as it is already being done in the kingdom of heaven. Father, fill your people with the power of your Holy Spirit and the fire that we need to walk in a dark world as children of the light. Would you cause fear to be pushed out and replace it with a new level of faith, Father, this week. A new level of faith to understand that our identity is grounded in who you are and what you've called us to be. Father, I speak and release that favor and that blessing as we walk as your children this week. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.